right, welcome back to Swine Time Podcast here at Pipestone. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Wayne. I'm one of the owners of uh, Pipestone and one of the staff veterinarians. I'm here with another one of my partners, and uh, he's not my boss. He's not my boss's boss. I think he's my boss's boss's boss, Joel Neerum. He is our chief veterinary officer uh, here at the, at the clinic with our veterinarians. And I can't keep track, Joel, how many, how many swine vets do we have on staff now? Yeah, t- today, Spencer, we have 34 swine veterinarians on staff at Pipestone through Pipestone Veterinary Services, uh, 29 in the United States, and five in Mexico. Okay. Today, I got you here for a special topic. The special topic is African swine fever. And if I was going to broaden it out, or not broaden it out, if I was going to detail it a little bit, it'd be preparedness and preparation for what is now a disease existing at a neighboring nation very close to the U.S. So, I don't know where you want to start. Why don't you give us a little bit of a background of ASF, uh, the origins of it recently, at least in the last few years, and where it's gone and where it is to now physically around the world. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think most of our listeners um, are familiar with African swine fever. Uh, it is, I would say, the, the most important disease of pigs worldwide. Uh, the disease has been uh, known about for a long time. Uh, it, it originated in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa and has largely uh, remained there except for periodic incursions into Europe and a few other places. Most notably in about 2007, I think, uh, the virus made another incursion into Europe and was not contained. And so everything that we're dealing with today, I think originated from that, uh, that escape of the virus from Africa. And so it's been in Eastern Europe and Russia and then in I believe it was 2018, <clears throat> found its way into China. And so once it hit the world's largest pig population, uh, it, it has really exacerbated uh, its impact on the world. And so today, I think we're really talking about African swine fever with a heightened awareness because it's in the Western Hemisphere again. Uh, it was 40 years ago that the virus was last uh, in our hemisphere and uh, recently in July was diagnosed in the Dominican Republic. And that's where it was before. If you go back, how many years ago did you say? 20, 30 years ago? I think 40 years ago is when uh, some USDA programs in collaboration with uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti and some other some other Caribbean nations, they were able to successfully eliminate the virus from the hemisphere. Okay. Uh, so it's been 40 years since it's been here, roughly, uh, but it's back. Hey, can you describe briefly, how did they get rid of it 40 years ago? Do you know anything about that? Because... That maybe sets up what what we can do now, or is it totally different? Yeah, I haven't studied it. I think, in large part, it's been the same strategy that's been employed uh, throughout history in dealing with this virus. It's mainly uh, stamp it out. It's identifying infected populations and then eliminating those populations and then containing it with biosecurity. So uh, we're not going to move or spread the virus through meat or live animals or other fomites and vectors, and really uh, a, a comprehensive surveillance that's done after those depopulation events uh, to ensure that the virus is gone. Okay. Yeah, I digress a little bit on that. But uh, so it's it's in DR as of, you say, July? As of July. I believe it was late July that the announcement came. Uh, it had been found in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it was found through uh, a cooperative surveillance uh, agreement the, the Dominican Republic was sending samples to the United States, to Plum Island, to have tested on a quarterly basis. And so uh, some uh, some sites that had some key mortality events uh, were sampled, and uh, they they uh, they found positives. And so uh, and then subsequent to that, they went back and and uh, tested what were really a backlog of samples. Uh, that had been collected but not tested and basically found that the virus had probably been in the country uh, somewhere between February and April of, of this year. So it had been there for quite a few months before it was announced and act- or actually identified and announced. Okay, so it's it's in the DR early in the year, and then recently it spread to the other half of the island, and it's in Haiti as of a week ago, or when did that, was that announced? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I think it was September 20th that uh, Haiti officially announced that it was positive. Uh, they had found the virus there. That was, again, through assistance with USDA and surveillance. Uh, uh, USDA is active in offering assistance to both the Dominican Republic as well as to Haiti in helping them uh, with diagnostics as well as dealing with uh, 
uh, you know, working through the containment of the virus and, and hopefully eventually depopulation. So USDA is involved and uh, providing support. Okay. And that would have been similar to 40 years ago, uh, that kind of an offering of support so it exists today. Our government's pushing to help diagnose and contain and eventually eliminate. So that machine's already already in, it's in motion already, it's been in motion for a while, fair to say, since, since the DR founded. I, I believe so. I believe that's true, yes. Okay. What's our involvement in this whole thing been? Because like everybody out there kind of watching the news because we know about it, but we've got a little bit of a special view into ASF because of our involvement overseas, not in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, but in China. Can you talk a little bit about that and why, I guess, why we're a little bit uniquely situated to look at it because of our experience? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, because of our uh, uh, activity in China uh, in providing veterinary service as well as farm management to Chinese producers, uh, many of our team have actually experienced and dealt with African swine fever to a great degree. And so just Dr. Joseph Yaros, uh, who leads our, our China uh, group today, uh, has been in China. He's seen the virus. He's worked with yeah. our China team to set up uh, biosecurity to, to prevent infection into pipestone farms in China. Uh, he set up surveillance testing strategies. Uh, we've, we've actually done a lot of African swine fever PCR testing uh, in China, uh, trying to maintain a, a level of health assurance there to protect our farms. Uh, and we've actually even experienced positive infections where we've had to depopulate uh, farms. And so we have experience in uh, biosecurity, containment, as well as uh, depopulation and cleanup and control. So one of the things that we recognized early on was, well, maybe we we had some experiences that we could share uh, in helping our neighbors to the south. And so we reached out through a number of channels to offer uh, to offer assistance. Yeah. So recently, the Lehman Spine Conference went on in St. Paul, and uh, you mentioned there was a meeting there where you were able to sit down with some folks from the university. It's not through a government channel. It would be totally different, but I would say uh, likely to be helpful in the DR and patient experience right now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because um, it sounds pretty interesting as far as the skill sets involved by the university folks. And then what you just mentioned was with, with Joseph and our group. And what we've done, we maybe are able to help the situation. I don't know what it will turn into, but why don't you hit that a little bit and describe what it is? Sure. Yeah, no, we were fortunate uh, at the Lehman Conference to, to be able to meet with Dr. Andres Perez. Uh, Dr. Perez is a, is a, a, a faculty member at the University of Minnesota and has uh, personal contacts with uh, individuals in the Dominican Republic, as well as uh, an, an organization of, uh, in Latin America that is active in supporting the efforts there. Um, and so we had, a, we had a nice discussion with him. Uh, he gave a nice overview of the situation. He had just gotten back from the Dominican Republic a few days before the meeting. And so he was able to share with us his observations uh, from what he was seeing on the ground. It's interesting the the situation in the Dominican Republic is a little different than it was 40 years ago. Uh, essentially, then, most of the swine production were in small uh, backyard farms. Uh, today, the industry is mixed. It's split. And so about half of their production today would be uh, similar to 40 years ago, smaller, uh, smaller farms, uh, backyard type production, we would say. And then about half of it would be modern uh, type uh, confinement production like we're more used to here in the United States. At this point, uh, what Dr. Perez was able to share with us was that the vast majority of the African swine fever cases in the Dominican Republic have been in the smallholders, the, the backyard pigs. There's only been one recorded case in a, in a modern confinement farm. Uh, that was a 1200 South farm that was diagnosed positive and then uh, depopped immediately. So, one of the things that he shared with us is that uh, because all of the efforts today are really focused on this high risk population, the more modern type producers uh, don't have a lot of, of support. And so one of the things that we offered to, to Dr. Perez was to um, make available our team that's had experience in dealing with ASF. If we could somehow connect with them and, and uh, share anything that we've learned that might help them uh, Number one, protect their farms and their pigs, as well as then support any of the ongoing operations for containment and uh, elimination. How many 
how many silos are on the island or in DR or AD? You know, any density or just numbers? To yeah, I'm going to maybe get this wrong, but <clears> I, <throat> I, I recall, I think it was about 120,000 sows. Uh, about half of those would be in modern production, uh, confinement production. The other half would be small holders. And so... Um, 125,000. 100, 120,000, roughly, I believe. Sows. Sows. That's way more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know what the density is? If you go in the countryside there, it could be small holders, the backyard pigs. Is that like China, a way less density? Any description of what that looks like? Because in China, that situation looks unmanageable. But in DR, maybe it's like, oh, it's way less than that. So maybe it is manageable for elimination there. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't, I, I, I can't answer that. I don't have enough, uh, visibility. I've certainly not been there. Um, I do know that most of the modern production is more in the north, central part of the country okay. uh, and uh yeah they, there's yeah, he even gave an example of a there they, there's they have built multiplication there so there's a multiplier farm that's got very high biosecurity kind of sitting up on a mountain somewhere and away from other pigs so a lot of the a lot of their their commercial modern type facilities are a bit separate from mm-hmm. some of the smaller holders and which may be an advantage to them obviously yeah. um, but i think it was interesting to date that you know, most all of the cases have been in the smaller farms that the, at least at this point, it seems like some of their biosecurity is, uh, is protecting, uh, the more, the more modern production. Do they probably get it through cruise ship refuge being fed? Is that, I heard that early on. I just think of how they get it as we go into how we're going to yeah. prevent getting it. There's been a lot of speculation. I don't think anybody knows and probably nobody will know. One of the things that they speculate is that it might have been in Haiti first. Uh, it wasn't detected in Haiti first. But it might have been in Haiti first, and then uh, that that uh, might have crossed the border. Uh, whether it was in wild pigs, or whether it was just in movement of meat or an- live animals, or something. Uh, but uh, th- that's one of the things that's been speculated, and I think today a lot of people would agree that it probably most likely uh, came into Haiti uh, simply just because the some of the the political and social stability of Haiti uh, might predispose it to that. Yeah. Right. I would guess their their prevention efforts are probably hamstrung by all the other stuff that they're dealing with at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So here it sits on the island of Hispaniola, a couple hundred miles off our coast. I don't know how far it is, but it's it's not that far into the Gulf. It's have. hundreds of miles. Hundreds. That's all. Yeah. Um, there's I don't think there's any food imports we bring from there. But now we see on the news there's Haitian, you know, refugees coming up to the southern border, probably not carrying coolers full of meat from Haiti, but but there's there's some connection. Obviously, it's, it's not that far away. You know, we've got we got a we thought about it for a while how we're going to prevent it here. It's, you know, feed biosecurity is one thing. But obviously, that the ports and not bringing meat products in from other countries. What do we have to worry about it here? I don't know if you want to frame it up with like what's our risk now? That is yeah. it maybe, is it more? Is it less? Is it <laughs> man? Is it going to be preventable here? Nobody can answer that. But yeah, well, I would just say don't rely on me as being a global disease transmission expert. I'm not trying to represent myself that in any way, but I think most of us would agree that the risk of a of a ASF incursion into the United States has probably never been higher, just simply with respect to the proximity of actively infected pigs to our borders. Um, I think one of the good outcomes recently has been the establishment of the ASF protection zone that USDA has pushed for and that will be hopefully recognized by our uh, foreign trade partners in that now the the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico are essentially um, part of that protection zone where we demonstrate, because they're, they're at higher risk of being infected. And that's really because of there's a significant amount of traffic in that Caribbean region between the various islands that are there yeah. of people and products and food and all kinds of things that could transmit the virus. And so I think it was very critical that USDA and, and, uh, NPPC and others were able to establish that protection zone, uh, to, uh, to make sure that we're physically protecting the continental United States as well as uh, protecting our ability to trade. So that's number one. Number two, again, with all of that movement down there, there is speculation that ASF could be on other islands. We don't know. There's lots of, you know, obviously a lots of islands within that region. And then even some members of our team have speculated on the connection between the Dominican Republic and countries like Venezuela and others that would not necessarily be on 
the same kind of terms with communication and collaboration with us. And, and the, there could be some risks there. And so I think right now we're working very hard here in the U.S. as well as in Mexico and our operations there with working with uh, the, the, the industries of those regions to raise awareness, uh, make sure that we're doing the things that we can to protect our farms and our countries and uh, and make sure that uh, we're active in uh, in surveillance. Okay. So just kind of thinking through, describing some history of, of uh, ASF and where it come from, at least recently, and it's traveled through China and now to our hemisphere of the world. Um, then, you know, how are they going to get rid of it? We don't know. How they're monitoring it. We've offered help. But then the unthinkable happens, and it shows up on a farm in Iowa. However it's going to get here, it shows up somewhere here. Take us through that. What what happens? Because that's been with some confusion kind of worked through on who's going to do what, what government agency does this. But can you lay out the, the immediate aftermath of the detection in the U.S. and what people have to do? Sure. Well, and so from 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 what we know, if if there is ever a foreign animal disease uh, detection event or suspicion um, in the United States. What will likely happen is that USDA, in conjunction with state animal health officials, will issue a 72-hour stop movement order, which essentially will put the entire U.S. pork industry on a standstill where there will be no animal movements permitted. And the goal of this 72-hour um, stop movement order is to allow state animal health officials, USDA, APHIS officials, to really do the epidemiology work to to try and identify any other animal premises that have contact with a suspect or positive location. The idea of that is we don't want it to spread while we're doing the work to identify any positive locations because our primary objective will be, like it was 40 years ago, to depopulate those facilities that are infected and contain the virus. Right. Right. And so the faster we can identify those those locations and contain it, the easier it will be to, to, to stamp it out, to right. snuff it out. And so that's the primary goal of the, of the stop movement order. And it might be 72 hours, it might be longer. Uh, but, but, but that will be the primary response we have to any detection of a foreign animal disease in the United States. So it's laid out as 72 hours stop and it's immediate. It's not like, Hey, within 24 hours, we're going to start because they did that with, uh, foot and mouth and, in England, I think, and then everybody said, well, we got to get our movements in now because they're going to shut yeah. it down here in 24 hours. So there was some, it was the counter, uh, counter their effort actually yeah. controlling it. But here it'll be immediate 72 hours. That's slaughter movements, queen pig movements, feeder pig, any kind of pig movement. Any kind of pig movement. movement. That's yeah. exactly right. It will stop. And yeah. so what we're telling, the, the things that we're telling swine producers today, uh, they really need to do two things. Uh, the first thing they need to do is they need to have a secure pork supply plan. Okay. Every, farmer should have a secure pork supply plan for every location that they raise pigs at. And so work with your veterinarian. Uh, we at Pipestone uh, have helped hundreds of producers create secure pork supply plans for their farm. And it's really important because secure pork supply is really a heightened biosecurity plan for your farm to protect it from disease and in the event of ASF to protect it from a foreign animal disease. Right. And it's critical that you have that because, um, as, as we work through these, it's critical to protect your farm. It's also critical for continuity of business because at the end of a stop movement order, whether it's 72 hours or 96 hours or, or whatever, um, any movements after that will likely be permitted by the state animal health officials. And so, um, farms that have a secure pork supply plan that's been documented and approved by your accredited veterinarian are likely to be able to move pigs sooner than farms that can't demonstrate that they have that level of biosecurity, that level of assurance about the status of their site. All right. And it, you know, having done a few of them, uh, it's fairly straightforward. You've got to make a map of your farm, kind of describe where the entrances are so that in the event of needing to implement this, this more intensified biosecurity, you can identify the boundary, the borders, how People interact with the farm. You have to go through a truck wash. All these, but you kind of describe the farm and how you're going to act during an ASF is what this whole plan is. It's not that hard to do. You got a Google Earth map, kind of draw crayon lines around it. And then the 
the, the process for approval essentially is this. You fill it out with the help of your veterinarian. Your veterinarian who is an accredited veterinarian says yes, and then it just gets filed in the state. There's no state approval of it. It's, it's fairly simple. It's state by state. Some states want to have <clears throat> more visibility to the plans and 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 I don't want to say approval, but they're they're more engaged in looking at the plans in advance. Some states are saying, if the vet says it's good, I think it's good. Okay. Um, so, but, so there's some level there, but, but we can help producers um, through that. We'll help them get the plan. Another important piece of it is training. So making sure that the staff is trained on biosecurity so your veterinarian can help you with that. That's a key component of the plan mm-hmm. is biosecurity training uh, and oversight. And then uh, we'll store the plan for them. Yeah. So in the event that something ever happens, you need your plan, we have it. Okay. And that pins... All this stuff fits to your NAIS prem ideas. Essentially, this this site has this plan. The state recognizes the plan exists, whether they have a copy of it or not. There's like we can file it here, and that all is just site biosecurity and how we're going to act when we really got to really be careful. The other piece that's not that is the epidemiology. Where did where did pigs go to and from during the stop stop movement period of time? Uh, producers should be able to account for their transportation. I got pigs from here, and my pigs went here. During this window of time, some in a somewhat orderly manner. That's not the biosecurity plan for flight. That's records. Um, it's a different plan. Do you want to comment on that? Or that will be necessary when we try to figure out where did this thing come from, where did it move to, and who's at risk. It, it depends a lot on big movements. That's exactly right. And so that's the other key thing that I, that all uh, pork producers today need to think about and have a plan in place. And that's in the event of a stop movement order. They're going to need to be able to provide 30 days worth of movement records of all animals, both onto and off of their farm. 30 days. 30 days. So whatever, the most recent 30 days, they're going to have to be able to, to show where pigs came from and where pigs went. And that's critical to the epidemiological work that needs to be done to identify um, sites that could be affected through, through movement relationships. Uh, it's also going to be critical for continuity of business. And so those farms that can provide both a secure pork supply plan and, ex- and demonstrate they're executing on it, as well as their movement records, are going to be able to demonstrate that, that they are low risk and are likely to get permitted to move pigs again sooner than producers that have not done so. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're really recommending everybody get your secure pork supply plan done and really have a plan for how you're going to do movement records. It's not hard to do. It, it actually goes fairly quickly. And the other piece, besides just it's the right thing to do, is actors are starting to ask for this now, too. So I think producers will be facing some pressure to get it done regardless. So get it done. Talk to your vet. You know, figure it out. Uh, get the thing filed and on, on record so that if this thing did happen, we'd be ready to, to operate business as normal as quick as we can. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to recap a few things, Joel. You tell me if I went wrong on any of this stuff. But ASF. Not a brand new disease has been in the world for a while. Uh, finally, it, it established itself in Europe, transmitted across to China, and then at that point, it looked like maybe before that even, the genie was out of the bottle, the horses out of the barn. It's it's too much to put back in at this point. So it exists in China, I would say, without really big hope of ever containing it well. Uh, second thing is, um, uh, you know, we have some expertise in dealing with this, and we've offered that up, and we're at some level going to be involved with health. Dominican Republic. Um, accurate? That's accurate. We're working through the University of Minnesota uh, in collaboration with the uh, with the University in the Dominican Republic to really connect producers there with members of our team that have some expertise in dealing with it. And so we're really hoping for a good collaborative exchange. Uh, we're hoping that it might even lead to um, our ability to go there and uh, and help as well. But we'll we'll see what becomes of that. But right now we've offered some help. And I, I think I think it's going to be accepted. Great. And then the third and last thing is, what can producers do? Producers be aware, be watchful. I mean, the pigs get sick in a very intense way, so be looking for those type things. But in the meanwhile, get your plans done. Make sure you get your plan completed on file, accurate and acceptable, and then you'll be as prepared as you can be for the event that it would show up in the U.S. and how to handle it and deal with it quickly. Yeah, I think that's a great summary, Spencer. The, the, you know, beyond the secure pork supply plan and the 30 days of movement data. I really think it's critical that producers uh, are aware of any changes in health in their barn, and, and most are. But my encouragement to farmers is if you're having unexpected mortality, 
if you're seeing signs of disease that look like pigs are septic, right? Their ears are turning purple or, you know, we're seeing uh, signs that are consistent with uh, something that's not normal in your farm, contact your veterinarian, right? Uh, part of this is just, is just heightened awareness uh, because we, in order to be able to react, we need to identify a problem as it occurs. And so um, be cognizant of that and, uh, and work closely with your veterinarian. Yeah. I, I could wrap it up there, except that as you're describing, you know, what to watch out for. I'm thinking, these sound like just really, really sick, fursy pigs in Iowa. The difference may be that furs might kill 30% of your pigs in a bad break. The uh, ASF eventually ultimately kills almost all the pigs. And so if you have groups like that or anything close to that where it's not normal, that's what to be aware of. But, uh, yeah, every pig that has purple ears probably isn't. Nope, you'll probably see not. You'll act differently, though, in your barn if it's going to be ASF. Okay, thank you, Joel. I appreciate you being here. I think everything you just shared with us uh, is valuable in that it's educational and also um, it would prompt us to action. If producers are listening, get your ASF uh, or get your secure, secure pork supply plans, the SBS plan, done and on file. That would be the one final takeaway for anybody listening to this is to get that done. Thank you. Thanks for being part of the Swine Time Podcast. Appreciate you listening and uh, stay tuned for the next uh, edition of Swine Time Podcast. Swine Time Podcast was created for the pork industry and individual pork producers around the country. Hosted by Dr. Spencer Wayne with the Pipestone Veterinary Services, the podcast contains pork industry news, advancements in animal care, and how to enhance your productivity. Monthly podcasts are available on Spotify, Google Music, iTunes, Anchor, and on www.pipestone.com.